This is a true story. This morning, I typed into ChatGPT what percentage of top 10 fantasy running backs over the last 10 years were sophomores, were in their second year of the NFL. And they spat back at me that that number was 40%. That's a true story. I don't think that was a true fact, however, because some of the numbers are wrong, and then I asked them to redo it, and then it came back at 33%. But I think it probably settles in somewhere between 30 and 35%. Just the percentage of top 10 fantasy running backs that end up being second year players. Usually if they're good, they kind of miss out on it year one. Year two, they are cemented into their workhorse role. I didn't fact check the entire thing because that would have taken me just as long to fact check that as it did to research for this entire video. So we're just going to talk about second year running backs in their entirety. Basically every single player from the draft class last year and how I'm looking at them entering 2023 because they are a very, very important group of players as it relates to fantasy football this year. They're basically broken down into four tiers. There's like, there's the very good tier. There's the relevant for fantasy tier. There's the conversationally relevant, but probably not good for fantasy tier. And then there's just the irrelevant for fantasy uh, until proven otherwise tier. So if you enjoy the video, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Make sure you tuck your damn shirts in. Make sure you flex them traps. I'll see you on the other side. All right, let's start off with uh, the very good tier, as it should be no surprise. Brees Hall is going to be the first player that we talk about. The New York Jets running back, first running back off the board last year. He would be the 101 in fantasy drafts this year had he not torn his ACL. Last year, as a rookie, he ranked first in yards per touch. I don't mean among rookies. I mean among running backs as a rookie. First in the NFL in yards per touch. First in juke rate, which is elusiveness. Second in breakaway run rate. So the percentage of his runs that went for 15 or more yards. Second in the NFL. Third in true yards per carry. Third in yards created per touch. So pretty much we are talking about one of, if not the single most efficient, explosive, and elusive running backs in the NFL last year prior to getting hurt in week seven eight uh it's pretty it's a pretty good combination it's a pretty good cocktail to have as it relates to being a fantasy football running back and add into the fact that he saw 31 targets in seven games technically but six games really because then he got hurt very early on in the other game extrapolate that out obviously he had a couple big spike weeks because the jets quarterbacks were throwing it off to the running backs at an alarmingly high rate but regardless he didn't play so yeah, whatever if you do the math comes out to between like 75 and 85 targets on the year Along with his big playability, just insane upside, just electricity in a bottle every time this man gets onto the field. Uh, the obvious big elephant in the room, other than Dalvin Cook signing in, in New York, is his ACL. Coming back from the ACL tear, which he actually had more than just a clean ACL. For a while, I thought it was just a pure tear, but he had work on his MCL, I think it was as well. Some kind of fucking CL. Uh, in which he needed to also get work done on. So the recovery, as we know right now, almost all of the reports have been optimistic. And he has a he has the profile of a player athletically, size-wise, draft capital-wise. Like the, the, the fantasy doctors on Twitter have done a lot of research on this stuff specifically for these players because that's the niche that they are fucking in uh, about the type of player that can come back quickly from these injuries. And he profiles as one of them. So wouldn't be surprised if he does get off to a hot start, if he does come back from the ACL tear very, very quickly and he's ready to role uh he is just a wildly talented player and you're getting him at an injury discount right now i'm you, you just have to keep a very 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 close eye on the injury reports as the summer progresses if they're all good i will be fine drafting him as you know you're getting him late second early third round right now in a lot of underdog drafts kenneth walker seattle seahawks as a rookie 228 carries 1051 rushing yards nine rushing touchdowns he tied for seventh in the NFL among running backs with six games of 20 or more carries top 12 in elusiveness eighth in breakaway run rate so he was juking dudes he was breaking away from dudes he was doing it at a high volume getting all of those carries okay now I have a couple back and forth statistics that I want to lay out here and I'll let y'all kind of decide where you sit with this now this was from uh, an article written on Yahoo I believe there have only been 16 rookie running backs since 2012 to hit the following numbers, 200 rushing attempts and 1,000 rushing yards. Now, of that cohort, of those 16 that have hit those numbers, Walker was one of only three running backs to fail to break 200 half PPR 
fantasy points. And of that 16 running backs, only three running backs improved their fantasy point totals the next year. So it's not great for what it says about Walker, but I think you can twist and turn a lot of numbers that look that way and start to raise the bar and efficiency numbers. And it makes it look a little bit different. Like myself, I went back and I saw that and I was like, damn, maybe we should be worried about Kenneth Walker with Zach Charbonnet being drafted. So I twisted my own little cocktail over here and I looked at rookie running backs since the year 2000 with a thousand rushing yards that averaged four and a half yards per carry. So it puts some efficiency behind those numbers and also puts kind of like a goal line workhorse role behind them. So you needed to have scored six or more rushing touchdowns. So we're talking about a thousand rushing yards, four and a half yards per carry or better, six or more rushing touchdowns as a rookie. That list, Clinton Portis, Zeke, Maurice Jones-Drew, Saquon, Jonathan Taylor, Todd Gurley, Josh Jacobs, Adrian Peterson, Steve Slayton, Kareem Hunt, James Robinson, Chris Johnson, Alfred Morris, Nick Chubb, Jeremy Hill, Joseph Adai, and... Kenneth Walker. Okay. Everyone on that list had pretty much outstanding fantasy careers outside of Steve Slayton, who was 195 pounds and got hurt his second year in the league. And Jeremy Hill, who was just pretty much fat and slow. He ran like a 466 40 yard dash. Kenneth Walker is not that. Kenneth Walker is 210 pounds and runs a fucking 438 40 yard dash. Obviously, adding Zach Charbonnet in the second round is not great. It's not great for the brand. Okay. But this is not like uh, Kenneth Walker is not a full fade for me by any stretch of the imagination. I'd be happy to have him on my roster as an RB2. This isn't like Rashad White getting Zach Charbonnet added to the backfield. This is Kenneth Walker who makes elite lists of statistical barriers like I just spewed at you. Okay, so Brees Hall, good with him at his ADP. Kenneth Walker, like him at his ADP. Damian Pierce, the next guy in this tier and the last guy in this tier, also like him at his ADP. Fifth, sixth roundish. He tied for seventh in the NFL with five games of 20 plus carries. They improved their offensive line. They improved their overall offense, new quarterback, new weapons, Shaq Mason, re-sign their tackles. Like their offense will be much, 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 much better. The problem with Damian Pierce, in my opinion, last year was one, they gave him as much work as he could handle, which is great because that means they have trust in him. But on the same side, on the opposite side, I guess, uh, he was never a workhorse in, in college, right? He'd never saw more than 106 carries while at Florida. And to ask him to do that at the NFL level now, when you're taking bigger hits, faster dudes, tougher to do, uh, it was pretty obvious, I felt like, to see that that was going to happen. And he hit some fatigue wall at the end of the year. Now, I'm not, I, I, I love Pierce. I think he's super talented. I think he's awesome. I think he's the type of running back I look for in fantasy. He's got the size that can be a three down guy, super efficient on all three downs. I'm not going to go all in because they did sign Devin Singletary. And there's a chance that Devin Singletary takes 40 to 50 targets in this offense. And Pierce is kind of left with scraps in the passing game. But I also don't think people realize that Damian Pierce actually had the second most targets among all rookie running backs last year. He had 39, so almost 40 targets last year. Second most among all rookie running backs. Only Rashad White had topped him. Obviously, Brees Hall would have hit that number if he stayed healthy. But regardless, even top three, pretty good relative to like the narrative around Damian Pierce not being a pass catcher. And Damian Pierce only played in 13 games. So for him to go over 900 rushing yards, for him to have nearly 40 targets in uh, a season where he missed an entire month of the season. He missed four games. Pretty fucking impressive. Uh, so everything to me points towards him being the workhorse there in Houston this year. How good is the offense? I don't know. Does he have explosiveness in him? I don't know. The pass catching role, not really sure. But I'm, I'm willing to bet on the talent. And we're not just betting on the talent because we actually just saw the Houston Texans give him a shit ton of carries last year. So I don't see a reason why they would not do that again. Let's move on to the relevant for fantasy tier but i don't really know where i stand with them as 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 it relates to the talents okay and if again you're enjoying so far make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the thumbs up button first guy on this list is james cook of the buffalo bills i've been really vocal about just not wanting any part of james cook this year he's just never going to be the workhorse there uh he's literally never gotten more than 14 carries in a game dating back through college he's in an offense where he went he won't get goal line carries there's a a, a a mobile quarterback which means there are going to be so many fewer targets to the running back position than there would be in a normal offense like you look back the years in which Allen has been a starting quarterback in 2020 14 percent target share to running backs the league average is 19 percent in 2021 16 percent target share it's just this is we don't we, we think of josh allen and we're like he he's not a runner he's this white dude so we don't equate the amount of rushing attempts he has like when we think of running quarterbacks right we think of lamar jackson and then we penalize the running backs in that offense i love jk dobbins but most people are like i'm staying away from him because lamar jackson does not dump the ball off to his running backs you look at any sort of running quarterback and the percentage of targets that do go to running backs 
is much lower. That I'm not arguing that case, but Josh Allen should also be included in that argument. He ran the ball 124 times last year. That's a really fucking high number for a quarterback. That was, I think, number three in the NFL. So if we're going to penalize all these other mobile quarterbacks or going to penalize all the running backs in an offense with a mobile quarterback because they don't throw, like they're athletic, right? Their first instinct is not to dump off to somebody else. It's when they're in trouble, they run. Okay. Josh Allen is the same. Also, Naeem Hines is there. Like, and I don't think he's good, but Naeem Hines took 40 targets last year. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just out on James Cook. And the more I research Rashad White, the next guy up in this tier, the more I'm probably out on him too. Um, I think he's like kind of like James Cook, where he has a very nice pass catching role, or he should project to have a nice pass catching role, but he was just miserable on the ground last year. And we'll run through some numbers to bite that up. Uh Rashad White, he was the one that led all rookie running backs in targets last year. He had 58 of them, okay? He was tied for the 11th most targets among all NFL running backs last year, and that was while sharing a backfield with Leonard Fournette, who had 83 damn targets, all right? Now, this was a big concern about Rashad White coming out of school. He was more of a weapon. He was more of an athlete than an actual pure running back, and a lot of those big pumped-up numbers, I think, that he, like he, all of his success came by way of getting a lot of passes thrown his way last year. And a lot of that probably had to do with the fact that Tom Brady was under center and he always throws his running backs at uh, a stupid fucking high volume, all right? So we look at the ground numbers last year for Rashad White. Among 45 running backs last year with 100 carries or more, his rate of carries that went for 10 or more yards, 6.6%, 43rd among 45. His 2.9% 15 plus yard carry rate, 37th out of 45. PFF run grade, fourth worst in the NFL. Yards after contact per attempt, second worst in the NFL. Only Lenny was worse. His elusiveness grade, 37th in the NFL. The fewest, the single fewest rushing yards over expectation per attempt. You look at the list, Melvin Gordon, Michael Carter, James Robinson, Leonard Fournette, Najee Harris, Zeke, and then Rashad White at the bottom. He was just awful. And to be fair, he didn't get a lot of help. Like their run blocking offensive line was miserable and I guess you could look at some of the upside and the positive is the fact that Lenny's gone which means those 83 targets and a lot of carries and a lot of goal line carries are gone and he's probably the starter for right now uh there isn't much competition it's like Chase Edmonds Keyshawn Vaughn Sean Tucker this is a disgusting running back group maybe one of the worst in the uh, entire league actually the team might be really bad too so maybe you want to equate that to more dump offs to him but I don't know if they're going to score a lot. Uh, I just think the likelihood of things going south. Overall, the conclusion for me where I'm sitting right now with Rashad White is I don't have a super strong take. I think when I don't have a super strong take on a player, I'm usually not. I'm definitely not going out of my way to draft them, which means someone else probably will. So when I think of Rashad White, I think the likelihood of things going south for him as it relates to fantasy are far more probable than them actually breaking right. One of the other resources that I use, and I've talked to you guys about this before, and it's something that I, I use for like long-term prospects, but it also helps me kind of have a vision for these younger guys that we do so much like projecting and we just think about like the long-term XYZ of a player and, uh, and and what kind of upside he could possibly have. But the Mojo app is like the sports stock market. So basically there's a career price on every single player that comes into the league. And the career price is based on projected future earnings like projected future stats so it takes a player it projects their career as for as long as they have it projected for and they make money per each statistical year banked and the dudes that put this app together are really fucking smart they're like ivy league dudes they're a very very real awesome company that spends all of their time trying to make sure that their market is efficient so i go to them because we don't have guys from fucking harvard building apps and graphs and stats and shit like that and this is the, a free resource for you guys to use in fantasy football and when I look at the players in this tier, Rashad White actually has the lowest future value on Mojo of everyone in this tier. So do yourself a favor, go download the Mojo app. It is absolutely free to join. And when you click on a single player, like go to Rashad White, go find Rashad White on the app, scroll down and hit compare. When you hit compare, you could filter by future value. So you'll be able to see Rashad White versus every other player and what their projected future value is. And that's based off of statistics run by really, really, really smart people. And you'll see that Rashad White has a lower future value than James Cook, has a lower future value than Brian Robinson and Isaiah Pacheco, who are next up on this list to talk about. We'll move to Brian Robinson 
Go download the Mojo app. The link will be down there. You can go invest in players right now if you live in Jersey. Anyone could download free to browse and mess around with it. But if you're in New Jersey, you could actually throw money onto it and invest in players long-term, short them. It's fucking awesome. Brian Robinson, another guy that I'm having a lot of trouble like finding a really solid opinion on. He's a dude who, similar to like Damian Pierce and those other guys, five games of 20-plus carries, a very, very high number. He did see the fifth highest rate of eight or more guys in the box last year. That probably is a result of kind of knowing what's coming when Brian Robinson is on the field. They really divided their offense in that backfield into a complete split. It was like Antonio Gibson catching passes, Brian Robinson putting his head down and going straight up the fucking middle. I, I, I'm He's not a fade for me because um, he's going late. Like someone who got as many touches as, as he did in a short time frame. I'm actually okay with both Brian Robinson and Gibson. I wouldn't draft both of them on the same team, but I would be okay with either of them. I prefer Gibson right now because he's the pass catcher. Uh, and he's going like two to three rounds later in most drafts. But Brian Robinson, another, listen, you go back to Mojo, and if you look at his future value on that app, it's really high. I think they have him as like a top 15, 16 back right now. He's above Kendra Miller, A.J. Dillon, Tank Bigsby, Cam Akers, which I highly disagree with. But again, there's a lot of people a lot smarter than me making those fucking numbers. So maybe there's something they know that I don't know. But R Brian Robinson is an absolute volume guy that will have his share of you know, 15 to 18 plus carry games, probably get some good work on the goal line. Not necessarily a target of mine, but if I fade running back all the way until the ninth round, like give me Brian Robinson, who I know is going to get double digit touches over James Cook, who's probably going to get like fucking four touches a game. And lastly, in this tier, we have Isaiah Pacheco. I've talked about him a lot on this channel as well. Uh, I suppose like my concerns with Pacheco come from two different places. It's a great story. It's a good feel good story. A dude who's a seventh round pick, like becomes the you know, the starter pretty much and gets a lot of work and, and does really well and has a lot of fun, like highlight runs where you watch him and you're like, this dude's a beast. But being a beast does not always project to longevity and success in fantasy football. And when you look, at, the problem is like the, the roles here, similar to Washington, are very, very clearly defined. It is Pacheco as the early down bruiser. And then it is Jerk McKinnon as the pass catcher. Does CEH, you know, get healthy and have a role this year? I don't know. Maybe that's another kind of wrench in the equation. Then Eric Prince is getting a lot of hype out of camp. He has an extremely similar profile to Isaiah Pacheco as well. Something else to keep an eye on. There's a beat reporter that penciled him into the 53-man roster already, which is fucking nuts. But the point being, Pacheco has a very, very clear defined role. And it is the early down runner. And you want to say he's the goal line guy. But this offense does not throw the ball on the goal line. Pacheco had seven goal line carries last year. McKinnon had five. CEH had four. And then you had six non-running backs that also had goal line carries. And then you want to talk about passing. Mahomes attempted 73 passes inside the 10-yard line last year. The next closest to Mahomes on that quarterback list was Kirk Cousins at 53. That's a full 20 fewer passes inside the opponent's 10-yard line. Inside the five-yard line, Mahomes threw it 35 times. So you're already looking at a rate a 61.4% pass rate on the goal line. Think about how insane that is. You're on the goal line and you're throwing the ball at a 61.4% pass rate. Obviously not insane when you have Patrick Holmes as your quarterback, but for any normal neutral team, that is a crazy low rate for running backs to get carries. And then 27 of those 27% of those carries were not even two running backs themselves. So, cool, you might say like, yeah, they pass the ball so much down there that means he's going to get receiving fucking touchdowns down there by the goal line. No. Pacheco did not have a single target inside the 10-yard line last year, despite Mahomes leading the NFL in pass attempts inside the 10-yard line. He had zero. McKinnon had 11. He did not have a single target on third down either. McKinnon had 20 of them. He's got no pass catching upside right now. Uh, his PPR and half PPR value plummets significantly. Can he, can he walk his way into 10 touchdowns this year? Yes, absolutely. But it's getting harder and harder to bet on that, in my opinion. All right. So let's move on to the third tier. Conversationally relevant, probably not great for fantasy. Jalen Warren's the first guy up on this list. Some of y'all might not even really realize that he was a rookie last year. Felt kind of wrong putting him in this tier with the other names. I guess not, actually. But also probably would have felt more wrong putting him in the tier above with those other guys. I'm a huge fan of Jalen Warren, like wildly efficient last year. Number five in elusiveness, number 16 in breakaway run rate, number 11 in yards per touch, number 12 in true yards per carry, number five in yards created per touch. The dude was really, really efficient. Uh, the problem is that while he's going to have a role in this offense, absolutely, realistically, he won't be super relevant outside of a Najee injury. Um, I expect him to have some good weeks, but 
more of a best ball pick right now or a handcuff pick for me. Same thing with Jerome Ford. He's getting a lot of hype. I just don't think he's that great of a running back, but he is like the next clear guy up in that Browns backfield behind Nick Chubb. They're saying they're going to feed him as much as he could handle, which is definitely not fucking true. And Kareem Hunt had a lot of his relevance uh, due to the passing game, which is not Ford's strong point. There was also some rumors that came out recently about them adding a veteran to the mix. They could use a guy like Kareem Hunt probably. I don't know who they're going to add to the mix. It's not going to be Zeke, I don't think. Um, maybe it could be easy. It could be a weird one-two combo. Definitely won't be Lenny. He's fucking toast. Ford's okay. I feel like he's more of like a talking point than someone that people actually like think is good. Tyler Algier is the next guy up on this list where this, this kind of hurts me because he was like actually fucking awesome as a rookie. Like there are not many rookies that rush for a thousand yards and Algier is on that short list, but they take Bijan in the top 10. So it's over for Algier. Although like if something were to happen to Bijan, the laziest statement in all of fantasy football, uh, Algier, we know, can do it, right? Algier can fucking handle the rock. He could be a big-time playmaker in fantasy. So, like, maybe he's the handcuff we're all really looking for, especially if you don't have to pay up for him. And he's someone who's already proven on a football field that he can get it done. And then Ty Chandler is the other guy that's, like, conversationally relevant for no reason other than Dalvin Cook is gone. Alexander Madison is the guy. Alexander Madison. Uh, then you have Dwayne McBride. And you have Kenny Nwangwu and all this nonsense. So, Ty Chandler, yeah, that's, that, that's actually malpractice, putting Ty Chandler into the conversation with Tyler Algier and Jalen Warren. But – they're all like fantasy relevant a little bit at this point. And then you just have a list of literally like 15 irrelevant dudes that we're not actually going to get into. If you want to argue amongst yourselves, you want to fucking yell into the void of the comments. Zamir White, Isaiah Spiller, Pierre Strong, Kevin Harris, Hassan Haskins, Snoop Connor, Kyron Williams, Tyler Batty, Keontae Ingram, Tristan Ebner, Bertin Brown, Raheem Blackshare, Zonovan Knight, and Jordan Mason. None of them are going to be relevant for fantasy this year. Maybe like a Pats running back. It's fucking 72 touches or some shit like that. We're not, we're not going to put any of those guys in the other tiers. Let's relax. Everybody calm down. Everybody take a sip of water. We can untuck our shirts now that the video's over. And that's it. All right. Second year running backs. Some of them are going to break out. Some of them are going to break their hip bones, end up in a nursing chair. I don't know. You said it, not me. But just make sure you're the one hitting the thumbs up button down there. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. I love you, and I'll see y'all on our draft streams later this week. Turn notifications on for the channel, cowards.